again, I point to this to highlight the fact that the catastrophe that is Yarmouk, the destruction of this very important camp, began before any rebel force stepped foot inside the camp. And and they are permitted over the next five-year period to use over 350,000 pounds annually of what they call expended materials. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown now on over 30 channels in the Northeast as Oradell, New Jersey begins showing The Struggle each week. Welcome to viewers in Northern New Jersey. If you're watching us on YouTube and would like us to have our show on your cable channel, just let us know. Contact mail at thestruggle.org. Well, the madmen are at it again. The experts are seriously talking about allying with Al-Qaeda. In Syria and Iraq, seeing them as lesser evils to ISIS, there was a piece in the New York Review of Books by Ahmed Rashid on June 15th called Why We Need Al-Qaeda. It suggested the U.S. follow the Saudi-Turkish strategy of making nice with the folks who blew up the World Trade Center. This is called strategic thinking. You can't make up this insanity. Today we focus on a part of Syria, the mostly Palestinian camp of Yarmouk, under siege by Assad, and then mostly taking, taken over by Al-Qaeda, which goes by the name of Al-Nusra in Syria. And this year Al-Nusra allowed its supposed arch enemy ISIS into the camp. We start at the left forum with Talal al Yan, a Palestinian-American writer who's also spokesperson for the Palestinian Network for Civil Society in Syria. I'm going to begin by kind of cataloging some of the events that happened in Yarmouk from the beginning of the uprisings that lead us up until today with the ISIS invasion and where the camp currently is today and give a brief overview of some of the casualties, um, the Palestinian casualties of the Syrian uprising. Uh, given the time constraints, I'm going to have to be brief, but during the Q&A section or afterwards, feel free to approach me with any questions. So the story of Yarmouk in the context of the Syrian uprising is really a very complicated one. And because it is so complicated, people tend to hide behind that complexity. Um, it's interesting, and I'll speak about this more later, that a lot of the same excuses offered by people who don't want to get engaged politically with Syria are also the same used by people who don't want to engage in Palestinian solidarity work. And I want you to keep this in mind uh, in terms of the framework of everything that happened to Palestinians in Syria and our response as Palestinians or pro-Palestinian uh, activists or what have you in the West and the diaspora. So during the beginning of the uprisings, Palestinian within Yarmouk, which is the largest refugee camp in Syria, got together and there was a lot of kind of disagreement amongst people. Among the youth, there was a strong push towards getting actively involved in the revolution. Amongst some of the elders, there was a little more hesitation. There was a lot of awareness of the fact that in any context of war, Palestinians tend to find themselves at a the receiving end of some kind of brutality, whether in Lebanon, uh, Iraq, anywhere. Ultimately, a very loose consensus was reached that, at least officially, the camp would take a neutral stance towards the Syrian revolution. Again, this was prompted much more by considerations of uh, historic Palestinian um, suffering in context of war than it was by any uh, affinity towards the regime. On the contrary, uh, most people who I have interviewed, who, who have escaped from Yarmouk and come to Europe, to Lebanon, to the States, seem to convey the same story, that there were huge affinities and sympathies amongst Palestinians, especially in Yarmouk, towards the revolution. But at first, it was at least partially muted. Now, this continued from the beginning of the uprisings up until May in 2011. 
During May 2011, I don't know if you guys remember, it, there was the commemoration of the Nakba, the great Palestinian dispossession. And on 2011, maybe you recall, a lot of states neighboring uh, Israel, historic Palestine, went down to the border and protested against Israel. And a lot of people actually got across the border and entered historic Palestine. Now, in Syria, it is almost impossible to get anywhere near the Israeli border, especially if you are a Palestinian. On this occasion, in the context of the uprising, the Syrian regime actually encouraged people to go down and protest and helped facilitate uh, you know, buses and what have you so that Palestinians could go down and protest. Well, they went down in protest, and the Israelis were generally unprepared, um, and so the casualties were relatively low. But already resentment began to emerge amongst people, amongst the Palestinian population towards the regime uh, to a stronger degree because of their inaction uh, after the Israelis had shot at Palestinians. Now, fast forward to the summer of 2011. During the commemoration of the Nuxa Day, in the summer of 2011, the same thing happened. There were arrangements for protests at the Israeli border, and Palestinians were encouraged to go down and protest, and they did, but this time the Israelis were much better prepared, and as a result, killed scores of Palestinians. It was exactly at this moment that the first public calls against the regime were made by Palestinians. One, two, where is the Syrian army? Now this eventually turned into a protest within Yarmouk that led a huge mass of Palestinians inside the camp to the headquarters of the PFLPGC, a very important actor in all of this. Essentially, this is, uh, of course, not to be confused with the PFLP. It is a, a split-off group that is very marginal amongst Palestinian society, especially in Syria, and widely acknowledged as being nothing more than a proxy of the Assad regime. So they went to the headquarter and eventually burned down the building. The head of this particular faction had to be evacuated by the Syrian army uh, to escape from this, this large mass of Palestinians who most likely would have killed him. I point to this event for two reasons. This began the phase in Yarmouk where there were public calls for the fall of the regime, public protests against the regime by the Palestinian population. Also, in discourse surrounding Palestinians in Syria, sometimes amongst the left, amongst uh, the Arab left, the Western left, the PFLPGC is portrayed as being some kind of representation of the Palestinian people. I think the very fact that the leader of this group had to be evacuated by the Syrian army for fear of being murdered by the Palestinian population uh, quite easily does away with that absurd assertion. Now, from the summer of 2011 up until December of 2012, you had a period where Palestinians began to more publicly protest against the regime. During the same period, the Syrian regime began to arm the PFLPGC to crack down on protests against the regime inside of Yarmouk. You had mass arrests, uh, political prisoners who disappeared in Assad regime jails, uh, crack down on protesters. Basically, the camp was occupied by this group that amounts to no more than an Assad proxy group. December of 2012 is another important date. Now, on December 2012 is when the Syrian opposition first entered Yarmouk. They called it the gateway to Damascus. It is important to note that the exact day before any rebel force stepped foot inside Yarmouk, the Syrian regime dropped barrel bombs on it. Again, I point to this to highlight the fact that the catastrophe that is Yarmouk, the destruction of this very important camp, began before any rebel force stepped foot inside the camp. And it only speaks to logic that this repression was born out of the acknowledgement by the regime that the Palestinian people largely sided with the revolution. And it's not really difficult to understand why. They lived in Syria just like ordinary Syrians. They faced the same political rep uh, repression, the same economic hardship, all the things that served as the impetus for the uprising were also experienced by the Palestinian population there. So in December of 2012, the opposition enters the camp. This begins the second phase of Yarmouk. Now initially, the factions that entered the camp were on the more so-called moderate side, and I say so-called because, again, I don't like the term moderate. Um, but were more secular in nature. 
I think it's important to acknowledge that elements of these oppositional forces uh, harassed the local population, were amounted to no, especially two brigades especially, uh, amounted to no more really than marooting thugs who harassed the Palestinians and uh, robbed the hospital inside of Yarmouk. But it is also important to note that these two brigades were kicked out not by the regime but by other oppositional factions within the camp. I point to this to highlight the fact to do away with the misconception that the opposition is one monolithic entity. It very much is not. Now, Yarmouk recently entered, uh, kind of grasped the attention of everyone in the West when ISIS entered uh, in April. It is, I think, important to note that before ISIS entered, Jabhat al-Nusra had a kind of brief reign over the camp where they also engaged in harassment of Palestinians, imposing their own fundamentalism. Now we can do all of this. We can acknowledge all of the crimes of the opposition, all of their shortcomings, uh, their harassment of the local population, without forfeiting what I think is the moral imperative, which is to acknowledge and to condemn the largest culprit of Palestinian suffering in Syria, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Now, I want to go over some statistics quickly before offering my own commentary about what I think the implications of the destruction of Yarmouk is. Now, these are taken from the two Palestinian human rights groups that are operating within Syria. Uh, the Palestinian League for Human Rights Syria and the Action Group for Palestinians in Syria. I specifically use Palestinian Human Rights Group because the tendency is when you bring up, say, Amnesty International, your claims are immediately impugned and people say, well, this is a Western organization and it's all propaganda. No, all of this information comes from Palestinian Syrians who are documenting these atrocities on the ground. As of today, 2,875 documented Palestinian deaths have occurred in Syria since the uprising. I want you to think about that number. I mean, I, I took a survey earlier of people who have some sort of sympathy towards Palestinians and the Palestinian struggle. 2,875 Palestinians have been killed since the start of the uprisings. Now, what really bewilders me is the fact that this is something that is very rarely spoken about in pro-Palestinian circles, at least in the West. And that when it is acknowledged, it is acknowledged with with a preface of, well, okay, we, we feel terrible, there are all these Palestinian deaths, but what can we do? Both sides are terrible. Returning to an earlier point, I want to appeal to the discerning members of the audience. When we hear things like, oh, we don't want to talk about Syria, it's too divisive, or oh, both sides are to blame, or oh, well, yes, the regime is oppressive, but the only alternative is fundamentalists who are going to spread Islam. Where have we heard this before? Anyone active in any kind of SJP chapter who has been to any divestment meeting has heard this before from the other side. We are essentially recycling Zionist talking points. For me, as a Palestinian, that is more than alarming. It is disgusting. The other thing you tend to hear is uh, this peddling of lesser of two evil politics. And I've heard it a lot from leftists in the West, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that anyone is free to peddle lesser of two evil politics, but they better damn well make sure that they have a Hillary Clinton bumper sticker come the next election cycle. <laughs> Finally, I, I kind of want to conclude by highlighting some of, of, well, before I conclude, let me just say that the overwhelming number of the deaths that I've uh, just given, the statistic I've just given, have been at the hands of the regime. Of this number, the largest cause of deaths is bombardment and shelling, almost entirely from the regime itself. The third largest cause of death of Palestinians inside Syria during the uprising, torture in Bashar al-Assad's regime prisons. 394 Palestinians have died of torture in Bashar al-Assad's prisons. You know, I've been, I've been writing about this and talking about this for, for three years now, and, and the, the point that tends to escape most people um, involved in Palestinian work, involved in pro-Palestinian work, is that the implications of this are much larger than the huge moral failure towards Syrians, towards the people inside Syria. 
They also, if, if you have no concern for Syrian life, for Syrian struggle, for freedom, for dignity, if your only concern is Palestinians, this has huge implications for the Palestinian liberation movement. It is my view that, that the one thing that has permitted the endurance of Palestinians throughout all these years, with Palestinians cast in all corners of the world, is our sense of collectivity. It's the fact that a Palestinian who grows up in Texas still stands up and deeply, deeply feels the suffering of a Palestinian in Gaza. It's the fact that a Palestinian in the West Bank will recognize the suffering of Palestinians in Lebanon. This is what has allowed us to endure and I'm afraid with the destruction of the Palestinian community in Syria, we have found in an almost unprecedented scale a disruption of this collectivity. And to our horror, we may one day come to find that we, by our own actions, by our own inactions, by our neglect of Palestinians in Syria, by our neglect and our, and our unwillingness to acknowledge the culprit of Palestinian suffering in Syria, may very well have signaled the final fragmentation of Palestinians. Thank you. Miriam Barkuti lives in the Palestinian West Bank. She has some words for those who want to ignore the struggles of Palestinians and Syrians in Syria. I reside in the West Bank and I've been politically active against both Israeli aggression and that of the Palestinian authorities. Um, and seeing and witnessing what's happening and unraveling in Syria, especially for Palestinian refugees, really contextualizes um, the Palestinian cause and what the future holds for the Palestinian cause. Um, it is essential to remember Yermuk and how it was once hailed as the capital of the Palestinian diaspora. It consisted of refugees that were seeking refuge, that were exiled from their land, and they were trying to build their lives and speak of the right of return and try to return. Um, and it is very important to remember this word, they're refugees, um, and what that connotes. So they, they, Palestinian refugees were scattered across the globe. Some went to um, Syria and, and Yermuk, and it acted as an active and a key role in, in the rise of Palestinian resistance and the rise of the Palestinian cause and placing the Palestinian cause on the map. And it is, is, it's with great sorrow to see what's happening, to see the reaction of the world, to see the reaction of Palestinians to this. Um, so I'll be speaking to you guys about the perspective, from the perspective of a Palestinian in the West Bank and the role of the PLO, which is the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the role of Palestinian activists in the international community in the context of Yermuk and Syria and the Syrian uprising. Um, as refugees, Palestinians are marginalized. And that is not exclusive to Syria, that is not exclusive to Yermuk. It happens in the West Bank, it happens um, in Lebanon, it happens in Jordan. They are the impoverished people that left and had nothing. They had nothing to give and instead were asking for help. So of course they were, there was this stigma against them as thugs, as troublemakers. And this stigma is still present today. This institutionalized discrimination is still present today, even in the West Bank. And it is important to note that fact because it's when the people have no power and they have nothing that their voices will not be amplified. And that's why you see a lot of silence towards people in Syria towards the Palestinian refugees in Syria because no one is speaking for them. And those that do pretend to speak for them, such as the PFLP General Command, are speaking on behalf of the regime, essentially. Um, which brings us to the Palestinian Authority, who acts as de facto the representer of the Palestinian people, when in fact the PLO has failed to represent Palestinians within Israel proper, Palestinians in the diaspora, Palestinian refugees. And yet, when Yermuk was being besieged, the first impulse was to ask for the PLO to intervene. And what they did was, they sent delegations to Syria, they sent delegations to speak with the regime, um, essentially to coordinate with the regime um, and when you speak with people in the camp and you ask them, well, 
you know, the PLO is coming. And they will respond, well, yeah, they're going to go and sit in their hotels and eat their fancy meals while we're being starved to death. And concurrent to that is the international silence, the silence of the masses that is not placing pressure on the PLO, that is not placing pressure on these government powers. So it leaves the Yermuk, it leaves the Syrians, it leaves the Palestinians stuck in Syria to stand alone. Um, which brings us to the role, and this saddens me to say, but of Palestinians and Palestinians that are active in the Palestinian struggle and their failure to show solidarity, their failure to act with their brethren in Syria. When we used to organize demonstrations um, against Israeli aggression or against the Palestinian Authority, you know, scores of people would come. And when we organized a demonstration to ask for pressure for, by the PLO, to actually intervene and do something while they were being starved to death in Yermuk, four people showed up. And it's a disgrace and it's sad because the Palestinian cause is such a just cause and its fighters aren't really living it up to the expectations. And it makes us ask the question, we are fighting, we reiterate UN Resolution 194. We let our children memorize UN Resolution 194 about the right of return and the refugees' right to return. But essentially, if we stay on this pace, they're going to be returning as ghosts. And we won't have to speak about the right of return anymore. Our silence has assisted and it has acted as a catalyst in the exasperation of the struggle, of, of the pain, of the agony of, of the Palestinians in Syria. Um, so when, when you speak to Palestinian activists and you, you're like, okay, well, why aren't you speaking about, you know, people, your, your, your brothers and sisters in Syria? Um, they, they give justifications under the emblem of, well, it's true controversial or my personal favorite is the Assad regime supported Palestinian resistance in the past, which is a misguided, <laughs> it's misguided information because that is, it's not even true, but what the Assad regime has done is essentially what Israel has done with its myth of the only democracy in the Middle East. It has illustrated and portrayed itself as this um, democracy, as, as the secular state, as, as this supportive power of the Palestinian struggle and the Palestinian plight, and utilize and monopolize on the Palestinian cause in order to justify the atrocities that it's committing. And it is so essential to, to know these facts, to understand these facts, and to not deviate away from, from saying, well, it's, you know, it's too complicated, and, well, you know, now you have ISIS. You, we did not have ISIS in 2011. It was not there. So there is no justification for our silence in terms of that. And if we are going to use, let's say, we're going to go play with, okay, the Assad regime helped Palestinian resistance. We're going to to pretend it's true. Does that justify what is happening today? If we are going to use this, this past to justify a monstrosity happening today, that's not, it's not right. It's, it's, it's morally unethical. Um, so there is this justification, and then there is the selective support where you heard an outpour of reactionary mobilization. I say reactionary because it, was, it wasn't strategic, it wasn't thought out, it wasn't an investment in the Palestinian plight when ISIS entered the camp. So when ISIS entered the Yermuk, you had a lot of people, you know, trying to do campaigns, you had pal the few Palestinian activists trying to gain traction, but it didn't. Um, or it did for like a week and then people gradually forgot. And what this has done, this reactionary mobilization, when ISIS entered the camp, has alleviated the regime from its crimes and accountability. It has allowed it to continue with its monstrosity, hiding behind these extremist groups that have used the Syrian crisis as a vacuum for their own political agenda. Um, which brings us to the international community. I'm sorry, did you have a question? No, oh, the flag. <laughs> Um, it brings us to the role of the international community. Um, as, Palest as a Palestinian myself, and as a Palestinian that's active in Palestine, when I, when I, I reside in the West Bank, when I came to the U.S., and I kind of saw this, this in, 
it's this wonderful support, you know, for Palestinians and for the Palestinian cause. And at the same time, when I mention, you know, Riyad Mukher, Sierra, they, everyone kind of gets a little iffy and backs away a little bit. And this, this divulges the hypocrisy in that solidarity. If you are not going to show solidarity in a whole and genuine way, then it is not solidarity. Selective solidarity is not solidarity. It is you working for your comfort, and that is not what it means to work for a struggle. Um, so when the PLO kind of began to work for Palestinians in Yermuk, when ISIS entered the camp in, in April, and when Palestinian activists kind of slowly started to talk about the camp, what they did was somewhat of a dangerous thing, and they spoke about it through a humanitarian um, discourse. You know, this is a humanitarian crisis. We want to try and create a humanitarian um, uh, exit route for Palestinians to leave the camp, etc. Not once was it really spoken of, of how the Assad regime is responsible for this. What they were essentially talking about is trying to find a solution for the symptoms of this dictatorship, opposed to the actual dictatorship and the removal of the dictatorship and the showing of solidarity with the Syrian people. And that also brings us to the failure of showing, as Palestinians, to show solidarity with Syria. That essentially we had to get Palestinians to speak about Syria or, or the besiegement because Palestinians were involved, that Syria's, Syrians being killed was not enough. And it makes us ask this question. Do we judge the worth of a victim based on who the culprit is, or do we want to fight injustice as a whole? And I will leave you guys with that. You've probably heard the advice that it's only safe to eat free-running Pacific salmon because supposedly Atlantic salmon is tainted with chemicals. Well, Democracy Now! had an interview with journalist Dar Jamel where he explains that the U.S. Navy will be dumping 350,000 pounds of toxics and other junk into the Pacific's Gulf of Alaska right in salmon migratory areas. Bon appetit. But these new exercises are the largest by far. They come at a time when scientists are increasingly worried about climate change causing Arctic melting. Meanwhile, the unprecedented melting has created an opportunity for the military to expand its operations into previously inaccessible terrain. For more, we go to Seattle, where we're joined by Dar Jamal, who is staff reporter at Truthout. He's just written a piece there uh, for Truthout and Tom Dispatch called Destroying What Remains, How the U.S. Navy Plans to War Game the Arctic. Dar Jamal, welcome to Democracy Now! So what are its plans? What is it doing, Dar? The naval exercises actually began yesterday and are slated to continue for 12 days in total and uh, continue on an annual basis. And they are basically permitted to con conduct war games that uh, involve a very, very large number of ships, aircraft, and personnel, as uh, was just described. And they are permitted over the next five-year period to use over 350,000 pounds annually of what they call expended materials. That means they're permitted to use bombs, torpedoes, missiles, uh, gun shells uh, and, and this type of material, including chafe and, and other expended materials, none of which is intended to be recovered. Uh, for example, some of the propellants used in the torpedoes could even contain cyanide. The EPA so-called allowable limit for cyanide is one part per billion in the water, and the Navy's torpedoes, and this is all according to their own environmental impact statement on the exercises, uh, actually will, will release between 140 and 150 parts per billion of cyanide. So that's just one example of the type of uh, toxics that uh, are likely to be introduced into the environment. And the, uh, the exercises also are, are going to entail the use of over 16, uh, around 1,600 uh, explodable five-inch uh, Navy gun shells, 45 of which contain 8.8 .8 pounds of explosives that are set to detonate with a fuse approximately three feet above the water. And the, the type of marine acoustic impact of that is the equivalent of a 500-pound bomb. The Navy EIS environmental impact statement also says that 
uh, the Navy's permitted to uh, generate 182,000 takes, which is a direct de a take is a direct death of a marine uh, mammal or species, uh, and or an indirect uh, take, uh, indirect death, which basically means the breeding, surfacing, or migratory patterns would be impacted, which would ultimately lead to death. So that's that's a brief overview of the type of environmental impact, and also in addition to the, the, the all five Alaska salmon species being in the area, it's a prime breeding and migratory period. This is the prime time of salmon fishing season. Uh, so many species moving through this area into Prince William Sound as well as further north into the Arctic. Did you get that figure, 182,000 takes? That means up to 182,000 animals can be killed all for the sake of this exercise. And what is it all for? What does the Navy think it's going to protect up north? The Navy doesn't say, but Darjamel connects the dots. The Navy needs to protect new oil wells that the corporations are going to drill in the Arctic Ocean, since global warming will soon make that sea ice-free for part of the year. Salmon, whales, and the rest be damned. By the way, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Last month was the hottest May on historical record. Just thought you'd like to know. If you watch our program online and it's before the evening of June 25th, then come up that date and see Joel Covell speak about the climate in crisis. It's up in Hartford, Connecticut. Go to the website pepeace.org for details. Here's a bit of a recent interview I did with Joel Covell. However, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake to think that our problem can be delimit, delineated as one of climate change, that if somehow we can fix the climate or somehow, you know, stop putting carbon into the atmosphere, uh, that our prob worries are over. I mean, I don't want to just be uh, Jeremiah here, but... It's important to realize that there's a fundamental process of ecological breakdown of which climate change is the leading form, but by no means the only form. Finally, from next week's program, a preview, some video from Atlantic City, New Jersey, a union trying to stand up to the threats of billionaire Carl Icahn. <laughs> That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.